welcome to DNAD Dinner With. Today we're having dinner with my very talented colleagues, Pentagram Partners, Jody Hudson Powell and Luke Powell. Hi, Jody. Hi, Luke. Hi, Naresh. <clears throat> um, so, for those of you who don't know the format, um, it's a conversation with Jody and Luke, and it's loosely structured around a meal. Uh, we're going to have a starter where Jody and Luke are going to share a project or two from the start of their careers. Um, a main course where Jody and Luke are going to share a couple of projects that have defined, helped to define their career to date. And then um, the bit we call the next meal, where Jody and Luke um, will share a project or two created by someone else that's helping to inspire them about what creativity can and should be going forward. Um, and as Luke and Jody, Jody and Luke share their work, which are, are you Jody and Luke or are you Luke and Jody? Either. Not me, as, Jody. Uh, just before we get started, I wondered, um, I was actually thinking it would be, it would be not nice to know because I just don't know. When, when was it? It was obviously somewhere at the beginning of your career, uh, but was <laughs> it uh, in the middle of uh, college or beforehand that you had the idea of working together or you knew that you'd be working together? When did that idea actually come about? We kind of, <laughs> we kind of touch on it on, when we talk about some of the stuff later. Actually. Mm -hmm. um, there was like a defining project which brought us together but then even after that, there was no kind of moment where we're like, okay, let's start Hudson Powell. We just kind of got a studio with a bunch of friends and we started slowly building a thing which became a thing. We didn't right. set out with an idea that, you know, we're gonna make a design company. It emerged from us just working more and more together. Right. It was um, pretty jamming, wasn't it? And that was around 2003. Um, Four. Yeah, well, we did, we did work together before that. When I was at Wildcat, didn't we? We, we, we there were a couple of projects that Jody kind of got pulled in on as a freelancer, and we knew then that um, we had fun working together. Yeah, I was still at St Martin's actually, and Luke was working yeah. on the first Gorillas live show, and he asked me if I wanted to do some content for it, so I did a couple of the like music videos. So even actually whilst I was at college and he was working, we, we found ways to kind of work together. And we worked on an exhibition called Motion Graphic Art as well, didn't we? Yeah, basically lots of stuff, yeah. Uh, I went to that first Gorillaz live show and uh, I loved it so much, I got myself a ticket for the following night as well. I bought my way in. So, wow, really? Yeah, I had to spend lots of money on the door. Um, well, maybe um, if you said you, it was, the question was going to come up naturally through a couple of the projects you were going to share, presumably ones towards the beginning, why didn't you share a couple of those? Yeah, starters, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it comes in the like second half of the uh, more. Like, <laughs> yeah. Does it? Well, let's just <laughs> let's just pick a, Let's just do the starters then. So, why don't you pick a project each that uh, was uh, helped give you your first break or um, gave you a, a taste for the things you wanted to do at the beginning of your career? Okay. Well, I I, I, I don't think any one project really gave us. I don't know if we've ever had kind of a big kind of wow break moment if, if if you like but there's definitely a couple of projects that kind of um at least got me my first job my first role so um i made a a newspaper at the end of my third year at central st martin's um with a friend of mine called venice and the the idea behind this newspaper was everyone had been working away very hard on their kind of dissertations for the last six months and um and we felt that it was kind of being with working within the field of graphic design, it seemed crazy that all of this work that had been put into the, these essays wasn't going to be seen by more people. It wasn't going to be kind of seen by not just our kind of contemporaries and kind of the people we were at college with, but why shouldn't that also kind of as a graphic design course be seen by Kind of a wider community if you like and the public can be put out there into the world and so we thought how are we going to do this um and kind of my friend venice very much took kind of charge of kind of the management and production of this whole thing and we and we, we wondered if we might be able to scrabble together enough money in advertising um, by asking all the local shops around us uh, for 50 pounds each we'd take a we'd make an advert for them for kind of um, selfishly, that was for consistency throughout the newspaper so that all the adverts had exactly the same style. 
Um, but we managed to do it and we kind of rummaged together about 500 pounds and this got us kind of about, I don't know, in my mind it was 5,000 copies of the newspaper printed, but I don't actually think it was quite as many as that. And, um, and, and, and they were in the foyer at the exhibition and we had kind of this small crack team of students who went out into the, the local area and, and also took them home and took them more broadly, it went out into other boroughs and kind of distributed this newspaper. So, cause I think we very much felt that kind of graphic design was for everybody. And, you know, this was our first foray into thinking of it in that way. And, um, and that aside, I learned a lot about print production and I learned a lot about typesetting and kind of actually making kind of a real piece of print, which I hadn't had that experience up till that point. And as a result, I got my first job out of college at a company who terribly, I can't remember the name of, in Portugal, I went to Portugal. Oh no, sorry, yeah. But, yeah. Well, there were two, and because I came back after three months and then got a job at the kitchen, which was um, some guys who were X Mark Farrow. And um, yeah, I directly got those projects because, you know, proof of typographic skill, production skill, and um, went on to learn a lot more about kind of print and making real graphic design in, in, in both of those roles. What a great story, what a great story. So uh, just off your own bat, you did that project and um, it, led to, it led to those jobs. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. What about you, Jodie? Um, so, I think just riding on that same point that there was no real big break, um, I've just pulled out a few things, which I don't think really answer the, the question at all, actually. But if you if you can jump them, one is like this, which I think my, the point I was, was going to make is that th this idea of like this mix of design and technology mm -hmm. was there at the very beginning with me. And it, I think it's this way of thinking has been like the vehicle for growth and me finding new opportunities and new people to work with along the way, which is, you know, built, built a career. And like, this was one piece, which I called AI, but obviously there's no AI involved. It was like kind of 1999. Um, and I was kind of beginning to learn how to program and I was really interested in, in emergence and this idea that um, by kind of writing simple kind of rules, you could make things that appeared to a viewer to be way more complex that you could interpret as being intelligent if told that this thing maybe is intelligent. And so I was doing kind of lots of work with code about kind of simulations and kind of observing them um, in, in different ways. And so, at college, it was, I suppose, when I came out of college in St. Martin's and I was doing quite experimental stuff with digital, which was still kind of emerging slightly at that time, it was it was easy for people to kind of see that um, they might kind of want to work with me. And in, like weirdly, lots of these ideas about kind of perception of machine and, and, and kind of compute and how do you visualize these ideas, which you find in like some more of our recent projects like um, graph core they're kind of rooted in in this kind of older thinking and then like there are a couple of other ideas but uh projects but maybe that's enough to kind of get the point across and this was my thesis at st martin's which was um i was interested in um kind of information structures and how do we access information and so i i came up with this idea or there was this thought that the way we navigate the internet is linear but you know, the actual way we navigate it, the way we experience it is obviously linear, but the way we navigate it is non-linear. We're opening tabs and tabs and you're going off on these trajectories. But the way that you look at a browsing history is just a, a single linear long list. And actually wouldn't make sense that as you navigate, you're, you're growing a structure which more closely mimics the way in which you're interacting with the thing, which is a network. Mm. Um, and so it was about that and data, kind of hierarchical databases and how do you visualize them, which then went on to be um, a piece of work that I, I carried on at the Bartlett um, a few years later in 2002, which is when I got into playing with AR and virtual reality, um, because I carried that same idea about kind of visualization of data structures and how do we kind of retrieve information from them and made it into this kind of VR experience where you could kind of touch data points and I tested uh, information retrieval speeds at 
across different kind of systems and stuff. But so like AR and VR and kind of this interest in technology, um, I think has been kind of part of the um, way in which kind of I've grown and we've grown and Luke similarly was kind of doing um, interactive work and experimental digital pieces kind of throughout as well. So yeah, no big break or big first job, but kind of, I think kind of small growth and just us being passionate and super yeah. interested enough to go back to college and, you know, do these things um, is yeah, how we got here, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they, they, they're, they're very, um, I mean, they're great projects and they're also very you, I can see your personalities um, play out on those as well. Uh, and I was going to ask you a little bit about that, about some, um, you know, information retrieval speed, did you say? Mm. Yeah. Versus like a newspaper. Um, you know, the, you've got, you've got, obviously there's, the, I know you just talked about Luke's interest in um, interactive um, design and media as well, but um, wh where are your differences as a pair and where are your overlaps and how do you, how do you, um, how do you bring, how do you bring that bunch of things together? Well, I, I didn't actually get on to my second one. Which Sorry. Was, no, no, it's all right. But I, I just thought I'd cut it there. But it, 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 my second position, which was at this place, Wildcat, um, which is kind of essentially a production company, so it was a complete switch from working in kind of a kind of a more traditional kind of um, design studio. And the, the 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 project was, I mean, you could flick to it quickly. Is the um, audio visual multimedia. <laughs> and ridiculously, this is a 5.4 format photograph from a TV screen of a video, which I'm not going to show you because I haven't got it anymore. Um, but essentially, it was, um, this is kind of, I was also interested in kind of, I mean, jody has been talking very much about kind of code and interaction. Um, this is a project that was kind of very much about kind of film and motion and um, animation, I suppose. And this is kind of one of our first forays into, um, I suppose, mo motion identity, um, except for it's very, very physical and it's not done in After Effects. It's actually a model that I made, filmed on the side, spinning with a black light. And it's kind of, it's, it's quite naive in lots of ways, but it was also, um, I, don't, I don't know. I think we were very interested in lots of different ways of working and in, in, in camera work as much as we were in animation and stuff. And so, to answer your question, we I've just happened to have presented something mm. that, that was focused in typography and I was working on interactive projects in motion. And likewise, Jody was doing um, a lot of design work at the time too. So that's, we've kind of pulled apart slightly and Jody's ended up with a slight bit more of a focus on kind of technology and animation and me a bit more on design, but um, it's um it's very much been in both of our kind of spheres of interest since the beginning. Is it is it important to um do you think when you're starting out um in a creative career do you think it's important to keep uh, exploring and keep experimenting? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I I don't think um I think it's everything actually. Um, right. I think all of our I mean, and actually, it's very much how we answer the next question actually um <clears throat> i think all of kind of our experimenting the different mediums we've worked in um have gone on to kind of be be our current practice essentially and i think without them um yeah i, I don't think we'd be doing as interesting work anyway yeah yeah um what well, a question from um one of the uh, people watching, I don't think we have their name, but um, it's about your, um, do you, what's your research process when you're um, exploring an area or a sector or a territory or a client job? Um, do you have, do you, do you, do you, do you like researching around the, the subject and the, uh, and the medium and what's your process there? I think we've both got the same answer to this. Do you want to answer it, Jodie? I don't know. I mean, we, we don't have any singular process. I think that's one of the main things. And it, I think actually sometimes we lose out with clients because they like to hear the confidence that you've got this formula and it works and it works every time and you're a sure bet. But me and Luke don't really work like that. Um, and it, it's super dependent on the different people and projects. Like if we're learning about some tech company and some AI, 
we like to go as deep as possible and really understand the technology at, at a deeper level um, so we understand what, what we're playing with. Um, and that's a real luxury because it means that, I mean, often we're working with quite brilliant people at brilliant companies. And so in a way, it's a, it's a real luxury to get time with them to really learn about something in a really deep and meaningful way. Mm. Um, Luke, how would have you answered it? Well, no, no, I mean, that, that's, I, I would have said that, but I also would have said if we, if, we, if we weren't talking about that part of it in terms of kind of <clears throat> really getting an understanding of a company, because we work with lots of kind of highly technical companies and we have to go do that big deep dive. But if we were talking more about ideas, I think um, we would say um, staying away from um, Pinterest and all of those things and staying away oh, from contemporary design and just, just I hate that stuff with a vengeance. Um, mood boards kill everything I, I think we, we very much want everything to start with ideas and those ideas should lead you um, or we'd like it to be this way it lead you down more interesting paths of research and right. so for us it's about starting with ideas and then those ideas they might take you down some you know strange pathway looking into some branch of science or mathematics or or, or you know some natural phenomenon or um you know uh, um, a political movement or something um um and without having that idea as the basis at the start you you, you know you don't allow um that research to go anywhere which is i think where kind of really interesting and unique ideas can be found um, it's the implication that if you start with um, Pinterest or a mood board, that you're, um, that you're, is it that you're getting too visual too quickly, or you're thinking too much about form uh, too early? Is that is that the is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think you get visual ideas. You get visual uh, ideas, which are kind of great, and they get you so far. And you know what? Well, there's been lots of great design and great brands built off basically visual ideas, but you don't get like concepts which you can then kind of really dig into and find a unique way to bring to life and I think yeah. that's what me and Luke often try and do is we find you know, new processes new ways of working um yeah kind of there's a bit of invention about what we do I think rather than just kind of designing through like a methodical kind of process yeah and that isn't to say that we're not inspired by aesthetics and you know and, <clears throat> and, and and you know visuals that we see out there it's just that that comes later you know after yeah. an idea has been formed and, and, and our aesthetics don't come from a um you know from seeing pretty things they come they, they're born out of an idea and then maybe that will lead us into a kind of a, a beautiful space like the covariant project that we did recently um that was all about decision boundaries and it was you know the final solution w w was based in the kind of a computer visualization of an ai um, um decision boundary and you know it, it it looks very pretty and it represents lots of other things about the brand about how they're human and technical etc um but it, it, it came from kind of a more kind of thorough piece of kind of research into kind of how AI works to get to that essentially aesthetic solution. Um, it's an interesting question building on this point from Mitchell, um, who's asking, have you ha ever had a project with a huge amount of um, experimental potential um, go wrong? Effectively, a client has shot it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, um, like yes and no. So we've had some really great projects, which and great ideas um, for clients who just couldn't see it and have been rude and, and shut it down, and the whole thing's got simplified. Um, but I think one of the one of one of the reasons why we make kind of tools for people, which could be viewed as one of the more experimental approaches is actually comes from a very practical place often. So with Graphcore, we made a tool for them because they were never gonna hire a designer and they had no marketing team. And so like where the value for them is to work with Pentagram, get this expensive or however expensive kind of well-crafted identity and then have nobody to use it and implement it. So no matter what we make, it's going to kind of 
fall over when mm. it never gets used. So in a way that experimentation comes out of necessity for us to create something that we can then hand over to the client for them to implement. So mm -hmm. often some of the stuff that kind of feels more experimental is actually born from some insight that we have of the client and it aids the process. We're just making tools to find new ways of working mm -hmm. rather than finding new ways of working for the sake of it. Um, what we saw quite often is, you know, expensive, brilliant brands and identities that die in PDFs on servers that never get used. And, you know, some of what we can do by making tools and handing them over to the client is to allow the visual identity to kind of live on a bit more and actually find itself being used. And yeah. Could you explain what the um, tool was in the, in the case of Graphical? I think that'd be really helpful. It was, it was just a pattern generator, super simple. Um, right. It was a problem with AI at the time that the visual language around it was really unhelpful, quite dystopian. It's lots of 3D renders of, you know, networks and robots holding apples and all of this crap. Whereas actually the real world implications of AI are very real and, you know, need to be discussed. But there's, I find there's this kind of visual discomfort where you have this kind of science fiction imagery paired with kind of, um, real world opportunity or problems and cases. And so we said like, instead of trying to find bad imagery, don't use any, any imagery, like keep it in the abstract. It's an abstract concept, use pattern instead. Um, and so anybody within the business, whether it's a CEO or an engineer can, can jump in, make new content without having to kind of go out into the world to find this terrible content, which is kind of damaging um, in some ways. Yeah. Maybe it depends how much trust somebody wants to put in us to tell the honest truth is in the, um, for example, the mushrooms project. <clears throat> I mean, it, it came, it didn't come close to not working. We always knew it was going to work, but um, the more experimental the idea is, the... You want to just explain a little bit about the mushrooms project for someone who yeah, may have seen it? Sure. So we um, created the exhibition graphics for um, exhibition um, that took place last year at Somerset House um about art and design and kind of the world of fungus and essentially what we did is we um <clears throat> we created a tool um to to grow letter forms and those letter forms we used within the identity itself um with um to to kind of create the the forms within the campaign they're also 3d printed um mm -hmm to create the letter forms within the exhibition space and they were used in kind of social and animation etc as well but it was there was a lot of experimentation in terms of we didn't know how we were going to build it before we started and so when the client was asking us so how is this actually going to look like well we we, we can't you know we, we don't know how it's going to look to tell the truth it's, it's it's growing naturally and so there was a there was a fair bit of um um anxiousness around that but also there was oh, there's a there was a hell of a lot of trust and so yeah. I mean, literally right up until kind of not long before the exhibition we didn't know exactly how it was going to look but we knew it all functioned at that stage we just didn't have the final version of it because it was kind of very iterative in the way that it was built and um but it looked great i mean we've never it was not a brilliant project it was a brilliant project i thought, <laughs> I thought it looked fantastic um a couple of questions um uh, to throw at you one from andre um does every project you take on have a technology component embedded into the design challenge? Um, no. 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 There you go. We, we work, I mean, I think it, we work across so many different sectors. And I think, I mean, we, we're, there's some more work to show and, but you, after we've been doing loads of tech, we want to do something cultural. And then when we're doing lots of like, did you start we want to do something so like we're always kind of changing and mixing it and it's not always there yeah we won't force it into something if it's not no. necessary I, I think it goes back to the point of that ideas lead everything and, and and if it isn't the correct solution then we won't force it into the project yeah um what uh oh interesting oh interesting <laughs> questions um let me just go back uh couple of quick questions I think we should go into the main course if that's okay uh yeah. they're just they are good questions how do you embed how do you implement critical thinking into the conversations with clients asks Matteo 
I would say that it very much depends on the appetite of that client to talk about design in that way. Um, you know, I think we, um, I think it's really important to kind of be able to collaborate and talk with a client. Um, and, you know, there's a certain amount of visual and design and kind of brand education that is needed kind of with every client. And some of them walk in and they get it straight away. And you can, and, and you can have those kind of slightly more critical conversations about the work that we're doing. Um, <clears throat> um, and then for other clients, that that isn't the case. And so I think it's very much to do with um, the aptitude of the client to kind of um, talk about projects in that manner. Yeah. If you agree, Jodie. Um, can you give me a one word answer on a question uh, that's been sent by someone with no name? Have you ever had a creative block? Mm, we're kind of lucky because we work with each other and we, uh, we unblock each other. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Individually we have, but we normally manage to get around it. <laughs> okay, great. Should we, um, sh I think it's time to move to the main course actually. Could you um, share, um, are you going to share a project each maybe? Um, uh, something that sort of defines the sort of center of your career or that's the that's the idea it's a very it's a very bad um metaphor the um courses but we'll have to go with it that's all right again luke but i mean i think I, just quickly one when we started hudson power we had three folios like we had a, a film folio we had a graphic design folio and we had a uh, a digital folio and that's because at the time people couldn't quite get their head around the fact that we could do all of those things and it was completely credible. And there was a typography folio at the end too. Yeah. <laughs> so, and at the same time, some people would just see us as doing kind of abstract artwork and exhibition stuff. So when we started out, and I think that's what we can share with you, we'd have these small wins, but they're in completely different places and all of these kind of group mm. together to finally kind of prove that, you know, you could within a single piece of work, have film, kind of graphic design and digital all playing a role. Um, mm. So Luke? Yeah. <clears throat> so this was PJ Harvey. We, this was kind of a crazy bit, um, project for us. Um, we hadn't started Hudson Power yet. I was freelance at the time and Jody, you are working at Nokia yeah. and this project came in to co-direct a video for PJ Harvey with um, a lady called Maria Mocknash, um, who's uh, directed almost all of um, PJ Harvey's videos. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and I thought, yeah, I'd really like to do that, but I'm not gonna do it on my own. <laughs> uh, that sounds terrifying. Um, and so, I asked Jody if he would, and this was kind of probably one of our first big solo collaborations, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and Jody kind of quit his job at Nokia and kind of went all in, and we created and we made a video with um, Maria, which unfortunately got canned by PJ Harvey, the first one that we made, because um, Maria had this idea that. It was a cool video and it had this big blonde woman like walking through this kind of after effects scene and it, it, could, it, all, and it was collaged and they were very close friends and um, she didn't think that she needed to sh show um, Polly the video and when she saw it she was like it's fantastic I love it it's, it's such an amazing video but I cannot have uh, this, this uh, a central character in one of my videos that isn't me yeah and so um Jody and I scraped together all the footage that we had and kind of in, in a course of how long was it? it was like <laughs> we, didn't sleep, we didn't sleep for three nights and yeah. we made a music video. And yeah. I had to get on the bike over to like somebody at MTV and that, and that was it. And that was it. Well done. That's brilliant. Great story. And how was it? How was the how was the uh the the second cut of the music video? It's cool. It's just uh, great taste with like loads of liquid and it's it's weird. <laughs> Yeah, I think was it, it better? was better. Uh, was it better? I think I, I think it was better. It was it raw. Was cool. It was done really randomly. We like set all the machines up with it was kind of semi done like procedurally. Like we we set some stuff up and then just hit render on as many machines and then waited like 
a couple of nights and then cut together what we had. It was, yeah. But it's, it's still up there. It's on YouTube, on the Warner site, you know, on the Warner channel or whatever it is for her video, Shame. And uh, anyway, you know, that was kind of, it was career defining in the sense that it, I think we'd made lots of video work before that. We hadn't done it at that level. And, we yeah. were, and then so the version of us at the beginning where we were like, yeah, we make music videos and we made a, we made a few. Yeah. Um, and then what's, the next, project? what's the next one? So this is Hello Kitty. So this is really early days augmented reality, like super hacked together. So using VRML, um, like by me, and you hold a marker up to your chest and it replaces your face. So like super early kind of AR filter, as you now know it on Instagram, um, but done in like 2005 or, or something like that. Um, and this was at a big exhibition in Hong Kong. Um, and again, it's, it's not career defining, but it was a moment where we could kind of put some of our interest in technology, this stuff that people hadn't really started using yet, that I'd kind of been seeing being used and like circling around in like academia, but not yet in the kind of commercial um, world and just jumping in DIY, kind of tying it together with string and it, it worked well enough to, to be an exhibition. Fantastic. I mean, you seem very, um, I wonder if, um, I wonder if other people who are tuning into this are getting the same impression or not. You seem very unafraid, or fearless uh, about experimenting. Is that, is that true? Is that how you feel? Are you happy to just roll up your sleeves, die in, drive in, try some stuff? Perhaps 100%. I think we've, I think that's, that's always been the thing that's excited us about the work. And I, I, I think we've, always wanted to try new things with every project and often that's involved you know that's often the, meant that we've needed to collaborate with other people you know to make things to make things happen but um i have to admit it's become a lot scarier with larger clients um, right we'll come on to that in a second actually <laughs> can we just before we do that can we go um a question from um uh ee -E. um was it difficult to start your own studio no, because we didn't. Oh, didn't you? <laughs> well, we did, but we didn't. We didn't do what people do, which is like design a logo and like buy a printer and maybe get a loan out and all of this other kind of stuff. We we hired we we rented a, a space in East London with a bunch of friends, and I was freelancing and Luke was freelancing. We ended up doing work not from other people's places, but from our own place. And, you know, where possible, we would do those projects together. And then over time, you know, you could call those projects collaborative projects or something. And then we came up with the name Hudson Powell. But at the same time, like I might do a bit of freelance somewhere else or we might do something by ourselves. And it, it really organically grew to be this thing, which was Hudson Powell, rather than putting any any structure around it, which might have allowed it to kind of fail or? Mm. It, it, was, it was definitely a conscious thing in the sense that we knew we didn't have the work. We knew we didn't want to get a business loan out. We were like way too afraid of that, but we knew we had work coming in, but we also knew that, that work wasn't going to keep us afloat. And so we, we, had, we were already doing freelance work. And so we balanced our kind of studio work out with freelance. And then there was just a point when it tipped over and all of a sudden, you know, we could afford to keep ourselves going. And, you know, we just went to great lengths to kind of never include like awful work in our folio, which had been done for money just to kind of, and then, you know, um, yeah, so it was, it was quite organic in that sense. Um, yeah. Um, but, and what, year, what, year, what year did it sort of not start, start? It was around 2005. Right. Yeah. Around right. 2005. Um, interesting question. Uh, it sort of perhaps takes us back a little bit, but I think that's okay from uh, Sudiksha, which is um, when you're starting out and trying to get hired as a graphic designer, how important is it to specialize in something? And I think they're possibly reacting to the fact that you're, mm. you, you have styles rather than a style. I, I, th I think it probably is quite important to tell the honest truth. Um, <clears throat> I think the reason that we kind of 
got away with it in a way is because we were doing our own thing a lot of the time and so we could um but it, uh, um but i think when we're employing people we we want people to have a really broad set of interests and all of our team are multidisciplinary in some sense mm -hmm. they all, they've all got you know a toe in a bit of animation or they're an illustrator as well or they draw type and and, and i think having kind of a broader interest in design is is really important just because of you know um within branding and identity and identity can be anything it isn't just a piece of graphic design and i think so having a broader awareness of kind of the other mediums and spaces you can work in is really really important that said we, we, we do need people to be good at a particular skill set yeah yeah yeah, I think it really, it depends as well on the person. There's no one way of doing it, right? I think me and Luke um, had a very broad skill set of skills and that worked for us and our, you know, our temperament and our personality and at that point in time, I think, like Luke says, we like people to kind of, maybe not specialise, but to care about something. And that thing that they care about and are interested in might sit across a couple of disciplines, but we... I want to be able to look at the person and go, okay, I can see what you're trying to do and why you're a designer and why you're approaching us. Mm -hmm. And that might be that, you know, you've got some not very good type and actually your motion is not great, but like there's something which I understand that you're trying, you, you're trying to solve through the process of like turning up every day and wanting to kind of reach out to us. So, yeah. yeah. Um, a question from Kai, which is how do you both gain or how have you both gained such strong confidence in yourself through time? I mean, I mean, it's a very comp to experiment is very confident, and uh, uh, mm. you know, to 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 move from freelance to your own studio, even surreptitiously, is a confident thing to do. So, how did that confidence grow? I I think it came from. I was thinking about this actually. Um, I, th I think it came from a series of opportunities that I had when I was younger, to tell the honest truth, that were in the kind of the creative field. Um, I talk about this in a bit, or I might do, I might not, depending on where, where we go with the conversation, but I, I've been a skateboarder all of my life. And through that, I've been given lots of opportunities to do things like yeah, we're just going to build a ramp here. Yeah, we're going to petition the council to, to and, and wow, there's a ramp, we did it. And to petition the council to build a skate park and we did it. And then the skate shop says, you know, do you want to do a range of t-shirts? Because I work in the skate shop. And, and I think through a series of events that happened when I was younger, where I was shown trust, mm. it, it made me, a, I could see there was a pattern here and that when people trust you, 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 you get given an opportunity, you do something well, and then more trust gets given you. And, 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 and I think I, you know, through college, saw, saw, saw that pattern and understood that pattern. And um, I mean, I, I was very lucky to be given those opportunities, but I think that's where the, my confidence grew from. Right. And I think I, I, I was lucky. I mean, I had Luke, he's three years older, right? So I, I kind of, I had some, you know, I was always, I could see him out in front and that that gave me confidence. And then I think beyond that, kind of suck at lots of other things. And like I had to either do this quite well and like believe in like doing it or I wouldn't, but yeah, I, I had no kind of fallback. So I think that in some ways gives you some confidence. There's also kind of, there was a, a lack of need to succeed, which I know sounds yeah. kind of sounds ridiculous, but we, we we never really were incredibly career minded. You know, we just wanted to create and make things. And I think when there's not a big goal at the end that you're trying to aspire to, you're a lot freer and more experimental in the work that you do. And kind of, I think only good things can come of that. So lots of the confidence was kind of like dumb confidence, if you like to tell the honest truth. <laughs> And also we were doing something quite different at the time. We, so we had no real kind of benchmarks. We weren't, it, it didn't feel, we've never been competitive about what we're doing. It just felt like we were doing our own thing and yeah. Uh, a couple of questions about sort of turning that experimentation to client work. Um, Giselle, I mean, you were talking about trust just now, Luke, and Giselle asked um, 
a little while ago, but it's a good time to bring it in. What's the what's the most effective way to win clients over or win their trust? How what do you find there? How do you create the space? How do you create the trust you you know you've talked about a couple of times today to do that experimentation or for that for them to be interested in that experiment and um, interested in it it turning out positively rather than worrying about it turning out negatively? Yeah, I I think with our I, I can't with our clients now, I think it goes back to that same answer that I gave about the kind of when do you how do you engage clients in kind of some form of critical thinking. I think we have certain clients that have an aptitude for experimentation and that's why they come to us. And so we're we're very lucky there in that sense. And then we and I think lots of our clients initially that allowed us to do these things were friends. There were people that we had close relationships with. So we could kind of first of all this these experiments started in a very self-initiated way. And then there's a kind of a proving ground with kind of people like Eat Your Own Ears, who's uh, who are kind of um, um, what's the word promoters, um, who who I worked with for a long time, and they you know they wanted kind of some wild experimental creative work, and so they were kind of e- e- eager to kind of um, you know buy into that experimental work that we had done before and then you've got a proof point for kind of the larger clients that we went on to work with i think there's something else as well like slightly coming all the way back to kind of reference that when you look at stuff in the abstract and it's void of context like that's one reason why we don't like reference because i don't you're seeing some a piece of design which is completely out of context so you you're gauging it Kind of primarily on how it looks and i think probably lots of our work looks experimental but when you get down into the functional quality of what it's actually trying to do for a client it becomes less experimental or it might be experimental but it's purposeful yeah. like if you're talking to a client and you can say well we made this crazy 3d thing but actually it's going to give you videos and it's going to give you stills and actually this is great for x and y reason then as a business, they can easily go, oh, okay, I can see why that's really useful and it looks great. So lots of the experimentation comes with kind of value and purpose. And so I think those that makes it more kind of easy to buy into for a client. That maybe answers Samar's question, which I think was an interesting one about, um, Samar was asking about how you make experimentation profitable or do you separate the commercial versus the experimental? I th- I think you just sort of answered that, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, at the beginning, we were doing lots of experimentation for experimentation's sake and just having fun with technology and collaborating and like making a mess. Um, and then that that's kind of turned into kind of client work and bigger projects where it kind of, that experimentation has to be a bit more purposeful, but we, we, still, find, we still find ways of being a bit freer with, the way we think like with mushrooms and stuff the reality is that it isn't always profitable and that we have to balance jobs off against one another you know mushrooms yeah. for an example was not it was a it was not a profitable job we, we lost a bunch of money on it in, in real world terms so it, it, it's about kind of um balancing that work um um R- richard's asked a question which i'm going to use as a segue into the the, the last section uh, Rich has asked, what interests outside of design do you have and do you find these influence or inspire your work? And I wonder whether um, it might be good to answer that by, or answer that perhaps also by showing the next meals, which is, 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 a, similar, is a similar question, which is what's out there that's inspiring you? The, 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 the initial question that you had, this is another one that we had a little bit of a <laughs> problem with the question initially, which is kind of what should creativity be going forwards. I, I think I, I, I found that hard to think about it first, just from the point of view is creativity shouldn't be any one thing by its very nature. It's kind of unshackled. And but I'm probably being overly pedantic because I think that maybe what, we, what we're really talking about is kind of, um, I don't know, pro- projects that use creativity kind of in a positive or kind of hopeful way like yeah that's one way of answering the question but not the only way i think but yeah um so so i i i had a couple what one of the issues which I'll, I'll skip through really quickly which is just kind of is going back to kind of skateboarding which has been a part of my life forever and um 
I've always been inspired by skateboarding, you know, one because of the creativity within the activity itself and one, you know, because of the community and kind of, you know, what I've gained from it. And, and I think it's got a, a large part of the kind of the confidence that I, that I have. And there's one particular project, which is called Hackney Bumps. There's lots of them. There's, there's Keep Pushing up in the kind of um, Tottenham and, and Hackney Bumps. And, and there are projects like these going on all over the world. You know, it's a really kind of active kind of community in that way. Um, but Hackney Bumps is a community skate project they've taken an old skate park which is kind of very rough and broken uh, and then you know they've toiled and toiled and with a little bit of funding have, have have polished back and repaired and made this skate park new again and, and one of the amazing things about kind of skateboarding is it kind of it makes public spaces like really usable again and it kind of yeah. it, it opens them up to everybody not just the skateboarders and so um you know the, this park which it, 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 in, in Clapton is um you know it I mean it was a great park before but it has this extra layer of kind of vibrancy to it now and it's a real community space and kind of they do these skate jams there and free lessons and you know it, it, it's kind of a small thing and I just you know I went a couple of weeks ago with my son but it just it made me really happy to see that kind of that community that I've kind of always been involved in is still doing these really kind of positive things um it's really good to see it's also very interesting that it's it's um it's very sim it's a similar type of answer to what paloma had last month when she was talking about experiences um that actually um gave people uh, that sort of distributed great greatness to people who actually wouldn't actually have that experience and uh that's a that's a very similar type of project as well and i have got another one but i'll, I'll pass over to you jody yeah, um, so I think, like, I think now more than ever, just being at Pentagram and it being like, you know, a place that is known for design, I feel like I'm being pulled more into the world of design and I'm more aware of it now, whereas I completely wasn't going into Pentagram. Like, my, my frame of reference was very little to do with design. Um, but I think still I don't really look to design for for inspiration or, or right. find particularly interesting, if I'm honest. Um, not to take anything away from it, but that's just not where I gravitate towards, if you know what I mean. Uh, no, I mean, I don't need it, I do design. Uh, so this is uh, runwayml.com and it's a site program framework which allows people to play with different um, machine learning models. And I like it because it's, you know, it's kind of DIY, it's messy, it allows anybody just to get in and have a play with, you know, machine learning. Everybody hears so much about it, it's going to take everyone's job, jobs away and AI, but kind of what does it mean for the creative industry? How can you kind of play with it, hack, hack it about and like make, make a mess with it? And I think that ability to make a mess and play with something is, is part of a process of kind of demystifying yeah. I think yeah. that demystifying bit of technology, which is so important that you can open it up and have a play and lots of the emerging tech, they, there's a kind of a real barrier, you know, you need to be able to program to a certain degree and what um, Runway allows anybody to do is just by clicking buttons and connecting things together is to, to kind of play with um, these different models. And I think that's like super powerful and I play with it a lot and um, yeah. If you're interested in machine learning and that's a good place to start if you're a designer just to kind of have a play and there's something else similarly which is like a site my friend built tommy um called anything io and it's actually primarily about kind of image collection and reference which isn't something that i do personally but like in the old days and like the early days when we were setting out it's just like people i swear people used to make more stuff and play with technology and play with the web uh, and the webs turned into these kind of big watering holes i think you know the big tech giants and their services and the big websites which we all know we should visit and him building this using kind of modern kind of web frameworks and using machine learning in a like, practical way initially this was like a a tool he was using for himself to categorize his own kind of reference material and then to be able to build that into a framework that other people can use just feels 
I, that, I find that super compelling. It's kind of DIY. It's using all of the availability of kind of all the stuff, good stuff that's available on the web and is possible now. Um, yeah, I'm attracted to kind of people making stuff. Mm. Yeah, they're brilliant examples. Um, can I ask, um, Luke, you were saying about sort of design with positive intent. Uh, I mean, can how can design be more ethical and more sustainable assuming you agree that it should be is that is that an imperative that you feel you see i i don't know i think design's got a bit of a problem there in lots of ways you know in, <laughs> i mean lots of the projects that i find they're doing great things in that area are, aren't in design necessarily yeah. And yeah. the other examples that I pulled out aren't in de de design either, you know. And whilst I say I take inspiration from those the, those projects, yeah, but they they aren't design based. I think as designers, we've got you know a massive responsibility to try and push our clients towards you know not printing as much rubbish and you know and and, and being more sustainable and encouraging them to kind of you know that they don't need a meeting in person and that we have, we don't need to jump on a plane or or even get into a car for that matter um but um at the end of the day if i'm going to be completely re realistic lots of our clients make things you know <laughs> and um and uh you know we we, we 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 make a big effort not to work with clients that aren't doing good things in the world and who aren't sustainable but um uh you know that's you know i i don't know what else to say apart from that i don't think i think design's got quite a lot to answer for if i'm going to be completely honest design has yeah yeah what what, what are your thoughts on the same question jay um i, I think I, I i think that's kind of similar to loops i think if you i think positive change um happens um kind of probably kind of at a deeper more kind of core level in most businesses you know it's about kind of decision making and, and products and and services mm. and mm. and talent acquisition and all of these other things which make for healthy businesses which help them become kind of good actors in the world and i think is design um is often used as a, a veneer yeah. um, and i think we need to be careful that we're not making bad mis businesses look good when mm. they, they shouldn't. I think me and Luke are pretty good at that. We 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 go deep. Pretty good at making bad businesses look good. No, yeah. the other way around, by filtering out bad businesses, which we think actually aren't really in the world to do anything. Yeah, good. yeah, yeah. We turn down quite a lot of work for that. We yeah. kind of have, have a moral compass and um, try and assess what we really think a business is up to um, yeah. and, and make judgment calls on that because I think as much as we like to think that the work we do can have a positive impact and it can at times, I think we're more in danger of um, the other, which is kind of making somebody look good when they're, when they're not. Um, yeah. Um, following up from that question from Paul, um, who's asking what impact um, has your a contemporary approach um, to design? I, I guess it, 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 it including all the experimentation uh, and the interest in sort of technology as a design method, what impact has that had on the other Pentagram partners and the company as a whole? Not sure. Not sure. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I think... Oh. No, I was just going to say, I, mean, I, I think the other partners, they always, they joke about it, don't they, when we do presentations, you know, that everyone, everyone's got to add some more motion and some more pizzazz to what they yeah. do. <laughs> Well, I am one of those. I am one of those other partners. Actually, I, mean, I think we. I think it's. I think it's very inspiring to the um, Pentagram ecosystem. Very, very inspiring. Um, Victoria is asking, "What would be your dream client?" No, probably no client at the moment. Just having some free time to like just push around some ideas and make some things. You know, I. Right. I've, I've, yeah. You want to. So you want to re regenerate a little bit? Want to regenerate a bit, yeah, I think. Anything that goes into space. Something right. Like space. Okay. May not be so sustainable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you may have a problem there, but anyway. 
Um, can I ask a quick question? We should be wrapping it up. I just thought it might be an interesting question um, about um, for, for people watching about the idea of the workplace. Do you think the idea of the workplace has changed in the last um, 14, 13 months? And what does it mean for people in the future who may come and work in your team? You know, the idea of sort of dispersed team, you know, working. Oh, well, no, I'm, I won't put words into your mouth. You tell me. Um, yeah, I, I think there's, we've proved, haven't we, over this period of time that it works. And I, I, I think it's, it's obviously dependent on people's kind of um, willingness to use kind of technology and, and, and allow it to work for them. But we, we functioned incredibly well over this period of time. And I, and I think hopefully we will be kind of moving into a phase where we work at home a bit and we and and, and we, we go into work a bit. Uh, I think Jodie and I have worked like this for a long time before Pentagram. Um, we've always worked collaboratively with people around the world and kind of for mm. various projects. And I think right since the early days, since Responsive Type, we were kind of collaborating with people in kind of Brazil and France on kind of quite big projects. And, you know, before Slack, we were doing it with a blog, you know, and just, you know, all had kind of the back end details of the blog and we were using that like it was a Slack channel. So it's all very kind of comfortable and, and normal to us. I think uh, an, a, a big company like Pentagram, I think it's needed this kind of push to, 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 to make it clear that it does work. And um, yeah, we are looking forward to this new future of work. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so uh, should wrap things up because we're getting to seven. Uh, so uh, just like to thank um, Felix, Felix Townsend, who uh, is a very talented New Blood win Award winner from last year who did our foodie identity, the, the, the plates, the spoons, the salt, the pepper, etc. Uh, so big thanks to Felix and thanks to Yuri Suzuki, who's one of our Pentagram partners um, and his team for the introduction music made with knives and forks and pots and pans. Um, thanks, Yuri. Thanks to everyone who came to dinner um, tonight and for all the questions, loads of questions. Um, so thank you for those. And of course, most of all, thanks to the brilliant uh, Jody and Luke. Thanks, Jody. Thanks, Luke.